Hello, everybody. Thank you uh, again for being here with us today. Um, I have three of my colleagues here who are part of the core of uh, making Bloomberg Green happen. And we're going to have a conversation about some uh, recent work we've been doing uh, that speaks to things that are going to go on later this year. Uh, before we do that, though, I wanted to make an announcement about another exciting Bloomberg Green uh, event that's going to be happening towards the end of this year. Uh, we're doing for the second time a documentary filmmaking contest called Bloomberg Green Docs. Uh, last year was our first go around. Uh, we ended up with uh, more than 100 submissions from uh, filmmakers, many of whom were first time filmmakers, uh, who shared with us short form documentaries about their vision of the climate future. Uh, it was one of the most fun things we got to do last year. We had a big event in LA where we screened the winning films. Um, we're bringing this back for year two. So um, if you or anyone you know is a filmmaker who would like to submit a film to our contest, uh, there's a website, uh, bloomberggreen.com slash green docs. There are these postcards around that have uh, the entry requirements. Um, I'm really excited to see what we get for year two. Um, and so please help us spread the word about Bloomberg Green Docs. Uh, the other exciting thing that you can pick up uh, at the end of uh, the event today is a copy of the latest issue of Bloomberg Green Magazine, which just came out about a week ago. Um, that's basically how I'm going to start the conversation with my colleagues here is speaking about some of the things that are in this magazine. Um, so Akshat, to start with you uh, first. Um, we spent together uh, months talking about uh, someone named Sultan Al Jaber. Uh, he is, among many other things, going to be in charge of COP28, which is going to be in Dubai this year. Uh, the sort of shorthand that we developed for talking about him um, was sort of like Thomas Cromwell in, uh, in British history, like a, a commoner who, who had risen to be this crucial advisor to a king, not just any king, but the king of an oil kingdom, um, who now finds himself tasked with uh, you know, the world's most important climate event. Can you kind of introduce everybody to Sultan al Jaber and why he's such an interesting figure right now? Yeah, so he is uh, the CEO of Adnoc, which is the UAE's largest oil company uh, by a margin, and essentially the cash cow that has created the riches that is uh, the United Arab Emirates. Uh, but in his previous life, before he became the CEO of the oil company, he was also the head of their renewables uh, play, uh, which is a, a unique thing in the Middle East because it was the first country to actually make significant uh, investments in there. And so you have all these uh, contradictions in what he is. He's not a royal, but in a very power powerful position. He's an oil CEO now running uh, the, the climate summit that will decide progress for the world. Uh, and it was uh, you know, really good to explore that. Nobody had done this sort of detailed reporting that I hope we were able to manage. Uh, and it, you know, he's going to meet every important climate person through the year. Uh, so to get to know a person uh, with that background is useful. And you, everyone can read Akshat's story, which is out online now, and it is in this magazine here. But you are one of the few journalists who's gotten to sit with him one on one. Uh, I know the uh, response publicly, especially among climate people, has been very negative to him. Can you tell us a, a bit about what your conversation was like, or how did he feel about the reaction that he's gotten so far? Yeah, so he was an, uh, he, the, uh, he became president in January, and pretty much every headline after he became president was, an oil company CEO is running a climate event which immediately creates all these uh, uh, frustrations among climate activists who've seen that the fossil fuel industry has slowed down progress so far. Um, what we were hoping to do in our conversation with him was A, place those questions to him to get a response for all the controversial uh, statements that have been uh, thrown at him from, from not just activists, but also uh, credible green groups. Um, but also to understand how climate diplomats see him as an ally, which has come through in many of their statements, who want a more business-like approach to what is a, a bureaucratic uh, event. And so it was, it was good, for, good for us to be able to sit down with him, talk through it. Well, for those of you who are here who will also be in Dubai for COP28, Akshat will be there and we'll be having another event like this, so um, stay tuned for that. And now. Um, uh, Amanda, I wanted to ask you about another powerful, powerful person that was profiled in a slightly unexpected way in our, in our magazine, uh, the Florida's governor, uh, uh, DeSantis. Uh, we did a kind of climate biography of him, and uh, it wasn't exactly what you would expect for the guy who's you know, mostly known as maybe the heir to Trump and also the person who uh, is leading this backlash against ESG. Um, can you tell me a bit about what we learned about his kind of environmental backstory? Right. Well, uh, I worked on this story with... Uh, reporter based in Florida named Mike Smith, uh, who has been covering DeSantis a lot for months and kind of, you know, uncovered something not predictable about 
DeSantis as he was building this national profile as a sort of attack dog against ESG investing um, and, uh, you know, furthering these other anti-woke policies, kind of cultural war policies. Uh, you know, Mike realized that actually DeSantis has a, a pretty deep and deep pocketed uh, base of support among um, wealthy uh, 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 wildlife and nature lovers in Florida. And this is, uh, this is because, uh, you know, there has been a, a long standing and long stalled plan to restore the Everglades, uh, which, uh, you know, is very important for biodiversity and clean water and uh, just water supply in Florida. Uh, and DeSantis really has been the one who kind of got the money uh, secured and kind of got this plan going again. Uh, and uh, it's that has really won him, um, you know, the loyalty and in some cases pretty big donations too uh, from some of, uh, you know, the wealthiest people in Palm Beach. And in fact, Paul Tudor Jones told, um, uh, told Mike, uh, you know, I'm basically a one issue voter when it comes to Ron DeSantis and that issue is the Everglades. And he gave him, I think, close to a million dollars uh, for his reelection as governor. And so this is a, a, just a really surprising, uh, uh, you know, support base that he has. And meanwhile, other environmentalists in Florida, like the Sierra Club, uh, you know, I think they gave DeSantis a D minus report card because, uh, you know, on the other hand, uh, Ron DeSantis also likes fossil fuels and, you know, says we shouldn't do anything to to inhibit their development. Yeah, I was going to ask, does this does this predict that he will be maybe a heterodox on climate or do you think he'd follow in the mold of Trump were he in, in power nationally? Yeah, I mean, I think um, one thing that he and his team have already done in Florida is try to project a public image as being a modern day Teddy Roosevelt, right? So that he he's a, a conservationist who is going to protect clean water and Florida's natural, you know, uh, Florida's wildlife and natural resources. Uh, but he's not going to use any type of mandates to restrict fossil fuels or, uh, uh, you know, really to take kind of uh, mitigation action on climate change. And uh, Todd, you had a piece in the magazine that touched on a subject that's just like the most buzzed about thing right now, which is the artificial intelligence. Uh, we weren't looking at like chat GPT or these kind of things, but you found uh, what I myself as a reader found to be a very surprising application for AI in uh, climate and environmental space. Can you talk, talk about the startup you profiled? Essentially, Skynet's going to save the whales. <laughs> <laughs> so collisions with big container ships and other big vessels are a leading cause of death of endangered whales. Um, on the East Coast and the West Coast of the US. And as an offshore wind boom gets underway on the East Coast, people are really concerned because one of the most critically endangered whales, the North Atlantic right whale. And its habitat is right where we're going to build all these wind farms. There'll be an incredible increase in ship traffic. So what happens is scientists put microphones called hydrophones in the water to listen for whale songs, whale vocalizations, or they use cameras that sort of scan, the, scan up to the horizon. Then AI, with they get a photo or a recording of vocalization. It basically goes through a library of thousands and thousands of whale songs or photographs to identify that species. And then once that species is confirmed, it sends an alert to a ship captain. Slow down. And, and so essentially the uh, whales are, there's a new risk because of clean energy. I mean, on, on balance, how is that playing out in terms of uh, people's concerns about these, these wind farms or any opposition? Um, some politicians have tried to make hay over it, saying that there was a lot of whales washed up over the last year in New Jersey, New York. Um, scientists at NOAA and the government say there's absolutely no evidence that wind farms. But there is concern about the ship traffic, because huh. ships are going to be hauling the materials to build the wind farms. And this is right where whales have moved in because of climate change. They didn't used to be in this area area for a long time, but because their prey is shifting, they're moving to where the wind farms are being built. So the government, the federal government has strict regulations about all the things that wind farm developers have to do to make sure that they're not leading to the demise of the whales. So this is a new tool for developers to use, and one of the first wind farms going up is using this AI tool. That's great. I, just real briefly, Akshat, uh, who among many other roles for Green is the host of our podcast, uh, Zero, and often spends time talking to people in startup and technology. 
more broadly, if we're looking at AI or large language models, what are some things you're interested in talking about this year in terms of how those things might be applicable to climate? I think in the last 12 months, we've had this uh, explosion of interest in AI because of uh, chat GPT, where you can just go in and ask a question and sometimes it gives you an interesting answer. But uh, what that kind of interest hasn't yet come through on climate. It's not like there is an application unless there's a whale application where you get uh, a moment where AI and climate have come together to solve a problem that grabs everybody's attention. But on the other hand, AI and machine learning, which is, a, which is the core part of how uh, artificial intelligence as we see it has developed, has been participating in improving small things for a long time. So we've written stories about two companies that I can point out, QuantumScape, which is a battery company, that used machine learning to try and figure out battery materials and new battery materials already. Another company called WeaveGrid has been using it to figure out how to uh, manage charging infrastructure for electric cars as the number grows uh, from a util utility perspective. Uh, and just having machine learning just simplifies the problem so much more. So we'll see more of those applications, but uh, apart from Rails, I haven't found a grabby one yet. So I want to switch tracks now because we're essentially the opening act for John Podesta and where there's going to be a big discussion I'm sure with him about uh, the IRA. So I, I want to talk about that and Amanda's been leading a lot of our coverage and I, I wanted to know if you could kind of remind people of the size and scope of what the IRA you know, was in its passage eight months ago and where you've been following the money lately, what we've kind of seen over the last eight months of where the money's going. Right. So uh, with the IRA's passage, this was, uh, you know, by far the biggest piece of climate legislation in U.S. history. Uh, you know, the bill contains, uh, I, I think we're going with these days, $374 billion. Is that the total accounting? I'm from like 370 to 374 over <laughs> right. some point. $374 billion of, you know, credits and incentives mostly uh, towards climate and is expected to spur uh, much more than that in private investment. I think maybe Goldman Sachs had uh, an analysis the other day putting the number at uh, somewhere in the low trillions, but uh, so you know, it's it's just going to be uh, uh, completely transformative, we think. Um, and uh, you know, after we at Green published the initial estimates and analyses, we've uh, turned to trying to follow as that money starts to uh, you know go out in, into the economy and uh, what we're seeing and what um, analysts are also seeing and predicting is, uh, interestingly, a flow of uh, that money uh, mostly to uh, red states, uh, states that voted for Trump rather than Biden. Uh, they are expected to see, uh, you know, well over half of the total investment. And this is according to estimates by the White House and other analysts are saying the same thing. And you're already kind of seeing that in the, in the form of, um, you know, solar developers flocking to states like Ohio and Indiana, where there's a lot of flat agricultural land and farmers who are pretty interested in, uh, you know, least in cutting deals with solar developers, but um, some of the state <laughs> legislatures aren't very keen on it. So that's an, a tension that I think is going to remain there. Um, you know, we're also seeing a kind of battery belt emerging mm -hmm. in Georgia and other Sun Belt states, uh, you know, as EV production really takes off domestically. Uh, so, yeah, it's just a super exciting dynamic period, I think. <clears throat> so I want to get back to the, some of the battery plant stuff with Akshat in a second. But first, Todd, I wanted to go to you because that's sort of like the macro cosmic scale of the IRA. But one of the things that you cover as part of our Greener Living uh, reporting group is sort of how decarbonization is hitting people where they live and, and literally in your case in their in their homes like we, we've been looking at kind of consumer applications today we had a story about how if you want to get an ev with the ira incentives uh there's only 10 models and if you want to get a minivan there's only one and it's kind of hard to come by but if you go inside the house can you talk about what some of the incentives are for homeowners and um, sort of some of the obstacles you're seeing in your reporting of people actually using these, yeah. these incentives? two words heat pumps um, <laughs> Heat pumps are electrical, highly efficient electrical devices that can replace your furnace, your furnace and your hot water heater. Um, the IRA incentives are quite generous, $8,000 for a heat pump for heating and cooling, which would pay, depending where you are and the size of your house, half, you pay half or two-thirds of the cost. Um, the problem is, as I found personally when I had to replace my hot water suddenly, is that even in San Francisco, where I'm from, 
there's a shortage of electricians who can do this work, and there's others who are like not familiar with the technology. I got a lot of conflicting advice and some wrong advice, so that's going to be a big obstacle: is the people to actually install these devices and walk the homeowner through all the rebate procedures, which are quite bureaucratic. Um, this money is being distributed through the state, so each state has to come up with its own program approved by the federal government before this can, money can flow. So it's not going to be until the end of this year at the earliest, probably 2024, before the money goes out. But already last year, heat pumps outstripped. Are they sold more? Heat pumps are sold than furnaces, which tells you the demand. Um, then there's like $4,000 to upgrade your electrical system, which is another huge hurdle. Most houses in the U.S. were built before 1980, which means for all this new electrical load, you often have to upgrade your system, which can cost tens of thousands of dollars. And most people don't realize that until the heat pump fa or the furnace fails or the water heater here, then they go, oh, you can't pull a heat pump in because you need to do the upgrades. Um, there's money for heat pump water heaters. There's money for heat pump dryers. You can replace your natural gas dryer with a heat pump. Um, so yeah, it's, it potentially is transformational, but there's this nitty gritty hurdles that need to be overcome first. And Akshat, I know that in, in this magazine you have a great story looking at an uh, unusual battery startup that's both been incentivized or uh, you know, pushed forward by the IRA, but they've been working on this technology for a while, and it's, it's kind of, a, I think, uh, emblematic of what's happening. Can you tell us about Form Energy? Yeah, I mean, one thing that all, that's also in the magazine is that climate tech has sort of entered a new era where it's going from you know, the old sort of wind, solar, and lithium-ion batteries, which continue to get subsidies, to new age technologies. Um, and for those new age technologies, especially capital is the, the biggest bottleneck. And so we have a story of Form Energy, which is a, a, a battery company that uses rust, so iron, uh, iron oxide, which is rust, and just converts iron into iron oxide and back again to, to charge up and, and discharge a battery. Uh, but they needed capital to scale up. And so they've got you know, now a $760 million factory that's being built in West Virginia some state money, some federal money, plus a ton of tax credits that is going to make their battery already competitive as they sell it uh, commercially. Uh, so that kind of uh, bottleneck solving is good, but I've heard from many of the startups now that government money is there. It's really permitting issues and it's these other steps that need to come through. So the bottleneck has just moved to a different place now. And I wanted to ask you one other question about the kind of broader uh, reaction to the IRA. I know you looked at Europe. There's been a lot of talk of this starting kind of like a trade war between the U.S. and Europe over green policy. Uh, what did you find in your big deep dive into the European response so far? Yes, yeah, so I live in London, and uh, after the Inflation Reduction, uh, Inflation Reduction Act passed in August, there was really nothing from the European side for months. And then suddenly the European leaders woke up and were like, oh, actually, there might be a problem here. And so we went through what the last six months were like. And essentially where we've landed is that Europe doesn't see it as a, a direct threat as much because now they've worked with the White House to figure out some of the things that felt like a threat. Uh, but also what Europe itself is doing, which is the Green Deal, um, is substantial and sometimes larger in sums of money it is putting forward. But it's just different because Europe is not one country. The rules are not the same they don't have the same tax rules, for example, so you can't play the tax credit game. Uh, and Europe is bureaucratic, so uh, the rules are taking longer to, to deploy. Uh, but overall, what we've noticed is there's just competition between Europe and U.S. and China on green stuff instead of just collaboration, which is the sort of fuzzy feeling after the Paris Agreement. Uh, and it's a world that people are used to. Well, we have one minute left, and I wanted to turn back to Todd and break away from the IRA. I first uh, met Todd working on a story about deep sea mining. It's an issue that he's deeply passionate about, and he produced some amazing scoops for us on it. I know there's a big issue with deep sea mining coming up over the summer. I wondered in the last minute if you could make the case yeah. for why this audience should be paying attention to deep sea mining right now. Okay. So electric car batteries need cobalt and nickel. The largest reserves of these metals are in the bottom of the ocean. Mining has not happened, but the international body that regulates mining is poised to prove regulations. And scientists believe this could be an environmental catastrophe. And one thing it has been paid attention to is that battery chemistry is changing. And it's probably highly unlikely we'll need these metals in 2035 or 2030 like we need them now. So we could be doing something horrible for the ocean for, income, for economic reasons that don't exist anymore. And 
uh, over the summer? Is there a, kind of a yeah, turning point or yeah. something to watch? July 2023, the International Seabed Authority is meeting. That's the to finalize regulations are to begin accepting applications to mine. They have not finalized the regulations, so it's big up in the air whether they're going to be able to move forward and take a mining application into consideration, but a lot of nations are calling for a moratorium or a ban on deep sea mining. Meg, are we allowed to take questions from the audience at this point? I actually do not have any questions from the audience right now, but I was going to ask you a question, which is, you have an announcement to make. Oh, I did. I did Green Docs at the top. <laughs> oh, you did at the top. I did at the top. Sorry, yeah. I but I will remind everybody again uh, to, if you, you see these postcards around, please grab one. And if you're not a filmmaker yourself, uh, to please give this to someone who is. Uh, one thing I will say, just to uh, go back to Green Docs, one of the coolest things that happened last year when we started this contest, I mean, we, we got great films from actually uh, accomplished filmmakers. The winning film was clearly the work of somebody who had experience making a documentary. But as a judge uh, in the contest last year, one of my favorite experiences was getting to see people who had never made a film before uh, do this. And we had a climate scientist whose film was about her work studying uh, climate change impact on sea otters, um, which was just really amazing. She clearly grabbed a, an iPhone and wanted to tell people the story about what she was seeing. And the fact that people were responding to this opportunity uh, with that sort of very personal work uh, really just meant a lot to me. And uh, getting to do this in year two, I'm, I'm really excited to see uh, what, what comes next. Great. And my other thing I was just going to mention is we will have copies of the magazine available if you hadn't mentioned that yet either. So those will be available here for everybody when you're leaving. Uh, the question was, how do you weigh in on the deep sea mining thing? Uh, like, uh, the question was, how do you weigh in on the deep sea mining thing? Politicians. So, politicians. I'm going to turn this yeah, on the top. So basically, there's 167 member nations plus the EU of the International Seabed Authority, so it's a really a state-driven process. So it's your national representatives. And I, just to go back real quick to, to some of your prior work on this, uh, a, a lot of the companies that are very interested in being active in this space are actually trying to influence um, not the United States government or like big governments, but it's often very small uh, developing economies where yeah, this is so happening. The, there's a company called the Metals Company. It's registered in Canada, and even though it's run by Australians, it has contracts or licenses from three very tiny South Pacific Island nations who are supposed to ensure that they comply with environmental regulations, have effective control over them, which they don't. I mean, this company raised more money in its last round than some of the GDP or the revenues of the countries. Um, I've also done stories showing there's a big conflict of interest between the ISA, the regulatory body, and the companies themselves. All right, well, thank you guys so much for being here, and, and thank you for being on the audience listening. Thank you.